Well, this brings us to uh, our next speaker. Yep, no break, we're going straight through. Uh, uh, before we do that, uh, and topically, uh, Tim, uh, this group wouldn't exist without Tim because for the first year, year and a half of data science Sydney's existence, it was hosted at Atlassian largely through Tim's efforts. So uh, this group had a home, this group had pizzas, this group had beer, this group got to grow so big it was too big for Atlassian and Tim is to be thanked for that again and again and again and I will keep doing that at every presentation. Um, also um, um, to introduce Tim, he should have done this presentation, what, a year ago now? Probably. But for various circumstances, including uh, a massive storm at one point, um, this, his presentation kept being delayed. So Tim is, and has been for a while, a uh, data science team lead at Atlassian, which is probably one of the more interesting places around town where data science happens and actually delivers business value and doesn't just talk about it. Uh, over to you, Tim. Thanks, Eugene. I'll uh, get it set up. Um, that was an amazing presentation. Well done. So I'm going to swap gears a little bit and talk about nothing to do with saving humanity. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish I could. That would be awesome. <coughs> I'll, I'll take you up on that. That sounds pretty cool. Man. I can get my password right. Hey, there you go. What I'm going to talk about instead is um, uh, one very small corner of data science that's uh, nothing to do with it at all, medicine. Um, it's using data science in software development. Um, so uh, I wanted to run through a particular project that we ran inside Atlassian to try and make features inside our software smarter using machine learned uh, models. Uh, quick disclaimer, this is a spike only so far. This isn't software that's actually made into the product. I was kind of hoping that uh, by the time this talk came out it would be, but that didn't happen. Still, um, that'll probably give me a bit more advantage because I can tell you, talk you through all the problems that we've had um, for doing this in the meantime and give you some tips on how you could make better software using uh, machine learning models. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, sorry, the other thing I'd say is that, uh, this is my opinion, um, I really like, uh, this doesn't necessarily reflect Atlassian's opinion, but um, Atlassian's really good in letting us hold our own, so have our own opinion, so I'm going to share it. The idea that we had for a smart machine learned feature in our software, um, it was based on two products that Atlassian makes. One of them is Jira Service Desk, which, as the name suggests, is service desk software. Somewhere where you can put in trouble tickets. Um, anyone, anyone in the big wide world can submit a trouble ticket. Agents will pick it up, and they'll work on it, and it'll get fixed, and everything's happy. Um, Atlassian also makes another bit of software called Confluence, which is a wiki, um, wiki on steroids. It's really great media file handling, makes diagrams. It's really good. Um, but, like most of our tools, we believe they should work better together. Um, so, a really common thing to do is have Service Desk as your troubleshooting software and Confluence as your knowledge base software. Um, so, we decided to uh, run a project to take all the knowledge base articles inside Atlassian's cloud software and all the Service Desk trouble tickets and mush them together and do topic analysis on these things. So the idea is that we could look at a individual ticket as it arrived and say, hey, that's talking about a particular topic covered by this knowledge base article. Or vice versa, this knowledge base article, that's uh, referring to all these tickets over here. Um, 
So we took all the, so we did that, and um, yeah, we did the same for tickets. So how do we do this? We built a pipeline as well. Um, the pipeline looks like this. Uh, we start with a list of potential features. This was one of the features that was a winning idea. Um, we talk to product managers and find out what's on their roadmap. And then we do some research. The research leads to a prototype. Uh, the prototype gets rolled out as an A-B test. And uh, if it's successful, it goes out as a product. If it's not, uh, it loops back a few times. We'll, we'll do some more uh, prototyping. So really straightforward, really easy, right? Not a problem. Oh, actually, a problem. <laughs> um, one of the first problems we had was what I like to call the new house problem. Um, this is a new house. You can tell it's new because the lawn's really nice and the lawn's never going to look like that again. Pretend for a moment this was your new house um, and you liked it. You liked it a lot, but you had a problem. You wanted the you turned to the builder and you said, I want that light move two foot down the wall. So the builder would sit there, think to himself, okay, that's maybe getting the sparky to hang around, we'll keep the painters here, that'll be 500 bucks. And you're like, that's great, that's, uh, I'm happy with that, let's do that. But maybe you don't want the light to move two foot. Maybe you turn to the builder and say, I want the whole house to move two foot to the left point, so I don't like where it is. Builder, clearly the builder's going to say, that's ridiculous, that's half a million dollars go away. Um, but it's sort of surprising how often these sorts of things occur in software. People come up with really small asks, uh, hey, can we just tweak this little thing, make it work it slightly different? Uh, and they don't realize they're actually asking you to move the whole house, just, just two feet left. That would be nice things. Um, so, we had one of these problems when we did our project. Um, originally what we wanted to do was look at all the knowledge base articles and as somebody started typing a ticket uh, they, that was related to one of these would suggest, hey, here's a knowledge base article that would be helpful for you. Um, but we talked that through a lot and we decided that's just Microsoft Quickie. It's probably not going to do a very good job. People are probably going to hate it. Unless it does a perfect job, people are going to hate it. So we're really just setting ourselves up for failure here. Um, leads to tip number one, you should always start with the design. If you're using pure design software and using machine learning inside it, the most important thing you've got to get right is the design. So we're really lucky we had some really cool UX people who caught this and, and suggested something else. And they came up with this idea. I'll run you through quickly through the life of Kelly. So Kelly's a agent in a service desk uh, environment and she's got 20 minutes before she's got to catch a bus and she wants to help answer one more ticket. So she clicks on a ticket and she sees a message down at the bottom left. Oh, not too fast, go back. Uh, down at the bottom left saying uh, there are Uh, there are five issues in Kelly's queue that are basically the same thing. We're talking about the same problem. A lot of people are having this problem today. So Kelly clicks through, um, she, instead of answering one ticket, she creates a click a new knowledge base article and she gets this. She gets a page that's a, got all the different tickets that are related to this topic uh, and a template ready to fill out to create a knowledge base article. Um, it includes all the tickets on the right, so she decides a couple of tickets, they're not really relevant to this article. She closes those, types up the article, and it's done. Um, the software says, great, we've closed all four tickets for you now, and a few other people involved. So that's pretty nice. She got to save, um, she got to kill four birds with one stone. Not too bad. Um, but she wants to know how this is like helping her over time. So she will go in and check reports. And she, this is one of the key features that we thought was really important for this 
piece of software to work. Uh, we felt like you should be able to look over time each week, see the number of new issues that are coming in, and the views on knowledge base articles. Because what you're hoping for, if this is actually going to work, science, we should be able to measure it. Um, you want to see new issues arriving, the number of new issues arriving in this topic going down over time, as the number of views on this knowledge base article goes up. Uh, and this was the design that we felt wasn't a Microsoft cookie thing. We felt that the agents were going to a, be less critical if we didn't get it perfect every go. And B, that was a really good audience for this feature because we were saving them the work. They got to do four times as much, hopefully. Um, the last piece of the design was we could look at all the knowledge base, sorry, all the tickets out there and you can see how big they are. So in here the circles represent the number of tickets that have, been, um, that have this topic, and then how well they're served. So dark red means we've got good knowledge base coverage. So we've got a much better design. We're not ranking Microsoft with the, um, should be ready to go, right? Well, it turns out scheduling and managing people and this sort of stuff's really hard. Um, this was our team. For the project, um, we had in the top, in the left, we had um, some designers and front end devs and product managers. Across the bottom, we have some data scientists and data engineers. And we have a um, qualitative researcher as well on the team. Um, and it, and it sort of really made things a little bit different. So, in software, sometimes we talk about the holy trinity of um, developer, product manager, and designer. These are the sort of requirements, the roles that you need to get software shipped, at the least um, the way we do it. And these people are very used to working to, with each other. So you can set them up and they'll go, and they've got rhythm and um, habits and muscle memory, and they'll develop great software. But what we were doing was throwing in different people now. So we added a data engineer, who did all the AWS thing, moving data back and forth, getting stuff in and out of systems. And we added data scientist who spoke a weird language that the product managers and the designers did. Um, so they were kind of like the squeaky wheels of the team. Um, we found a solution. So what we found was a new schedule that kind of works. Um, we keep the designers right up at the front of the project. Um, we keep the product managers across basically everything. Devs work in the middle, and um, data engineers and data scientists really come into the end. Um, and this, this is something that is going to keep everyone unblocking and happy, um, but it's not necessarily intuitive uh, unless you actually try it and fail. Um, cool. And the other tip that I have uh, that really made a difference to this project was totally designed for this audience. Don't forget to love your data scientists. <coughs> I'll give you an example why. Um, we, for our topic classification, we used a couple of different approaches. Um, some of these are up here on the screen. Um, we use latent semantic analysis using an R package, um, and that seemed effective as far as we could see, but man, it took a long time to run. Um, basically, maybe you kicked it off and went home, and came back tomorrow, and hoped that it had crashed. Um, we tried uh, some of the data sciences. We had a couple reading the literature and decided that, hey, we're going to use LDA in Python instead because it's really good. Um, and we went out and tried it, and it was, it was a heap faster. Um, but there was a better written package in Jensen and Python, which just got us um, a huge win for free. And then, uh, as I was putting these slides together earlier, um, I realized that Jensen in um, Python, doing LDA, was written by a guy called Matt Hoffman, who 
was formerly Princeton, is now Adobe, and he's written a whole bunch of LBA notations. He's kind of the LBA, sorry, he's latent virtual application. Um, he's the guy. And I discovered that he'd written an implementation in Verbal Rabbit, which is, um, if you know it, an online learning system that is usually incredibly fast. He contributed one of these to that. I got really excited and I thought, wow, this is going to be, it's going to be online, we can score things super quickly. Um, we are going to just throw data at it and it should be so fast. Um, then I realized, then I discovered just as I was coming here, it's actually what Jensen uses, so same speed. But um, this was a couple of days ago, and um, I just wanted to flag the fact that um, Understanding, having people understand the domain and migrate. And we, I think we had three so that um, data scientists really help during this fight. Um, so that actually went super fast. Um, these are the tips. Um, start with the design. Make sure you schedule people well. Uh, it's super painful if you don't. Um, and there is. Um, a lot of literature that really helps to underestimate how much um, the study of data science and people is stuck. Um, yeah, and I practiced that earlier today. I took that twice as well. So. <laughs> um, cool. So, thank you. <laughs>just like to ask a question that uh, in the machine learning research community, the LDA is largely replaced by um, based on parametric methods like uh, hierarchical delay process, which kind of allows you to uh, train a variable number of topics. So the, the, num the magic number K doesn't need to be sort of fixed in priori. Uh, have you, like, what are your thoughts on that? You, is, is that something that you're going to try? Or? There's a package in R called Topic Models, um, which does exactly that. Um, and it gives you both. So, um, yes, the trick would be to find, the, the next steps include um, further search for different algorithms, um, and that would get used. One of the magic bits is making sure we can return a response in less than a second in our school. So, 
fits that criteria and is really successful with the Yeah, there's, there's also an online version of uh, GPA. Good news, you made my app evening. Hi, um, actually the slide that I'm going to ask a question will just turn up. Uh, so I think, yeah, you used LDA or uh, latent direct allocation Python and then you used um, Gensim. Can you just, sorry, for my ignorance, but just explain um, why Gensim ended up the better option? Uh, in this case, it's speed. Um, I might, I'm going to throw to Alvin, who's one of the guys who worked on this. Do you have a comment? Yeah, it was, um, it was just really easy to parallelize. You can choose uh, X number of cores to run your over, so that made me up for that huge um, difference in speed. Um, one, of, one of the things that I've observed in both in my own behaviour and also in behaviour of the juniors that I have in my team is that it seems to be an endemic thing that you know data scientists and analysts will want to go down rabbit holes um, and you know <laughs> show me a problem and I don't want to spend too long on it rather than just enough to solve the, you know, the, the basic problem. D did you find that you had that sort of issue when you were you know working with data scientists in the team and, and if so how did you manage it? Uh, we have that issue generally. Um, <laughs> one of the approaches that we have is um, units of worksheets. So we've um, got Confluence pages uh, where we document what we're going to do, what the scope is, what the anti-scope is, so what we're not going to do, and usually that's the most important part. And um, we schedule work, well, we always think of work in one week blocks. So um, time boxing, and it forces people to make their own decisions. Um, it just makes the the trade-off, the opportunity cost, really obvious. <laughs> um, so you're using the um, the application at the moment to suggest knowledge base articles to, to the users. Um, the other use case that occurs to me: uh, Do you use this? Um, Matthew, you've, you've developed to triage the tickets as they come in then? You can allocate them to specific work areas or does it always go through an operator or you could suggest to an operator this is a particular that belongs to this development team or it goes over here. So is it used in a triage or could you see it being used for triage as well? To find the best, so one of the... One so, of so the quickest path, I mean one of the, one of the biggest problems is to, who, who, who uh, should be allocated this ticket to solve or yep. who's the engineer to fix it or et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, that's, um, that's uh, a really popular idea, especially with product managers, they would love to have that. Um, a lot of these things actually decompose down into a lot of smaller ideas. So um, the, uh, this, we probably won't end up running, running one algorithm um, even for this. We'll have a couple of different microservices that are um, scoring, giving different opinions. Um, and so, um, Yes, we want to do that where we find the best agent to hand your ticket. There'll probably <coughs> be a microservice saying, who's the, trying to figure out the smartest person who's know, awake at this time of day. And there'll be another one going, who's handled this topic the most and who's the most senior, and they'll vote. So we'll be doing ensemble type approaches. Um, yes, um, we definitely want to do that particular use case. <laughs> Thanks. Um, actually, I just wanted to add to the response because I think it was a really good question. Um, so I, I actually work with Tim, so um, we, we worked on this project together, but we're thinking about um, using this kind of idea or this technique to try and understand clusters, essentially, uh, of issues. And once we've got that understanding of clusters and issues, then um, there's a whole bunch of things and applications that we can build on top of that. So one of those is, hey, can we suggest what uh, sensible knowledge based articles to write? Uh, the other one might be you know, sensible aging routing. Um, another one might be, can we find issues that are very similar and therefore link them together as a particular problem to solve in, you know, in conjunction together uh, in the one kind of hit? Um, and 
Amog, who is sitting right next to me, is uh, thinking of working on that for his thesis. Well, if that's the last of the questions, can you please uh, join me in thanking Tim?